The more women are allowed to be all that we can be, the better it will be for the world. So a few years ago, I was um, living in uh, America and I was filming in Las Vegas um, and this young guy appeared on set who was covered head to toe in tattoos, um, what appeared to be possibly gang markings, I'm not sure. Anyway, I made all these assumptions about him and I felt really uncomfortable around him and was incredibly intimidated by him. And in that moment, I thought, oh my goodness, that's what it is. And as a woman of color, I often you look at sort of otherizing, which is what I call it, from the perspective of being on the receiving end and had never thought of myself as someone who would actually have a sort of unconscious bias and hidden prejudices. You know, I grew up in a very multicultural area, so I've always been accustomed to difference and comfortable with it. Anyway, so it kind of knocked me for six and I went to talk to him and he had had a difficult start in life everything that I suspected, but he was dedicated to making a change. Our sound man had taken him on as an apprentice, and I thought how difficult it was gonna be for this boy to become everything he could be, because even somebody like me was prejudging him. And I thought, well, wow, let's figure out how we have these difficult, complicated, uncomfortable conversations, and that's how it came about. So the, the whole premise uh, of Diversify is one, looking at the social, moral, and economic benefits of diversity. And two, looking at how we better connect with the other, whatever that other is for you. So I partnered with the team at Nuffield College at Oxford University. Um, I'm not an academic, so I thought I better enlist some people who are. Uh, so I worked with uh, Professor Ansi Heath and Dr. Lindsay Richards and Dr. Elizabeth Garrett. So yeah, they did a research. It took a year compiling all the data that was existing, but also coming up with new research. Um, and then the fun bit of all uh, was I also partnered with the LSE uh, to calculate the cost of discrimination. Discrimination. So what it actually costs us in discriminating against women, against uh, uh, disenfranchised men, disabled people, uh, gay people, um, age is another big one, and of course class in this country. The research was worse than I expected, way worse. You know, when you sort of look at the data, because the wonderful thing with research and data is it's fact, it's numbers, you know, it's not somebody sort of putting their opinion on stuff. This is cold, hard facts. And when you look at how much everybody else earns in comparison to elite white men, um, when you look at the high prison rates of um, uh, black men and Muslim men in our criminal justice system, when you look at how uh, women uh, are treated in the workplace and, and we still are not in the positions that we should be, even though we are in the workforce in numbers, we're certainly not progressing at the rate that we should be. And so when you look at all of that, it's fact. And, and the beautiful thing about data is it means that you can't deny it, so therefore we have to look at how we solve it. Well, you know, it's so funny, the issue of race, um, and I actually had a bit of a, a debate with the publishers over this because they wanted me specifically to have a chapter on race. And what I said was I didn't want to do that for two reasons, because um, it's nuanced. Just like the experience of white women is different from the experience of white men. You know, if you're uh, a, a white woman and you're married to a white man, your husband's experience in the workplace is very different to yours. And that's the same with anybody. So with people of color, it's the same. The experience of black women is very different to the experience of black men. You know, black women are not stopped by the police in the same numbers as black men. Um, uh, black women are not seen as a primary source of fear in the way that black men are. So I wanted to deal with the issue of race in the context of gender so that I could deal with it authentically. And what I talk about with black women uh, is uh, what's been termed the double disadvantage, which is being discriminated against because of your race and also because of your gender um, and what that means. And especially in a society where the beauty standards are the opposite of what you are and women are, are valued based based on looks, unfortunately, still in our society, even in 2017. And what that does to self-esteem of, of uh, young black girls growing up, growing up and, and how even women who become successful are still demonized in the press, um, whether that be a Diane Abbott or even some of the 
grotesque things that have been said about a Michelle Obama or a, 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 a Serena Williams. So I talk about all of that stuff too. Um, and so for me, it was really important to deal with them separately. I've seen lots of uh, reports uh, and press articles saying that I'm saying that it's women holding ourselves back. And, and I'd like to clarify just a little bit. Yes, we are to a degree, but also I do want to say, you know, sexism and misogyny is real. I'm not in any way downplaying that. But I do think that because women have been conditioned for centuries to think that we're less than, and because the woman, the day you are born, the way you are treated as a society, you just instinctively know that your male family members have better opportunities than you do. And even, even when families are trying not to do that, it's so ingrained, we all do. I even find myself saying to a little girl, oh, what a pretty dress. Do you know what I mean? It's that sort of conditioning. So because that stuff is so deep within our DNA, we're having to go against it every time. And the confidence and the self-esteem that that takes to sort of muster up is difficult. And what I say to, uh, to women is, you know, like what Sheryl Sandberg said, we do have to lean in. And for me, my sort of uh, voice of doubt, my insecure self, I've decided to name it. And so she's called Agnes. She's very annoying. Uh, so like Sasha Fierce. So Sa Beyonce named her confident self. I named my insecure self. And, so, and I think uh, what that did for me was it enabled me to sort of step back and not see that as myself and to see that as, 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 as a sort of an outside force that prevents me from taking risks or, or trying things that I want to do that I feel scared of. Um, and I think it's really important that women realise that, that actually we have to do as much in terms of, as well as men do, in changing how we view ourselves. I think the number one role model in your life should be yourself. I think too often we sort of look outside ourselves for validation and really the only form of validation you ever truly have is self-validation. So I think number one role model should be the person in the mirror and getting to like and respect and value that woman. Um, and I think the other thing is really important as well is to have a vision of the woman that you want to be, like who is the fullness of you and every decision and every day is working towards becoming that woman and then, you know, one day you become her, you know, it might take 30 years, but one day you become her. Some of my career highlights, I think actually my career highlight uh, was getting the, the break in the first place, you know, TV is so different now. I don't think somebody like me would have that opportunity now, you know, when I was starting, there were so many youth programs that you could sort of train on and test your abilities on and then get good enough to then go and do proper live telly um, and I think it's such a shame that those shows don't exist anymore so there's not a clear pipeline uh, for talent but I suppose YouTube is a new place for people but it's still a very different skill um, so I think the, the, the career highlight for me was being in the right place at the right time um, and getting uh, that opportunity uh, and then another one would be, um, I was so lucky, I got to host uh, Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday party, um, which was amazing. It was in Hyde Park, um, there was thousands of people, and it was not long before he died, and it was one of the sort of last public outings of his where he was still strong and he gave an amazing speech. Uh, that was phenomenal. Uh, I think uh, the pool viewers should go out and read a number of books. Um, books make uh, fantasy uh, a potential reality, don't they? They take you into a whole, a whole different world and enable you to see yourself differently. Um, I think the power I love um, uh, The Power. I think it's such a, oh, such a good book. You know when you get a new modern book that's so powerful and so exciting? And, and I, want, I want electricity running through me. Don't you want that? I wouldn't be able to do that if only. Um, <laughs> so I think every woman needs to read The Power. Um, in terms of a sort of monumental book, I think uh, Little Women, 
Everyone must read that. Um, and then a book which I now understand much more now as an adult than when I first read it when I was like 14 or something, uh, is Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. You know, I think as you get older and you sort of experience things in life, um, you understand that book even more. And it's one of those books that I return to sort of every five or six years. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, and anything by Jane Austen, <laughs> anything. <laughs> it was the funniest thing, well, you see, I was living in America and had been for like eight years or so, and I was getting ready to move back, it was really weird the time, I was getting ready to move back, and so I'm walking down the street in the States, and all these random British people coming up to me saying, can we take your picture? We need to, we need to show um, a celebrity juice that we found you, and I'm like, what? <laughs> We found her! And then they actually got in touch and brought me over to show that I was still alive. Um, <laughs> which was nice. It was lovely. It was so nice. But I've got a second part to that. So there was the um, Where is June Sarpon campaign. And then when I came back and I uh, joined the Remain uh, campaign, um, and the papers reported that I was there to try and get the youth vote or something. And obviously, I'm no longer <laughs> in the youth category. Um, and the young people then started tweeting, who is Jun Song? <laughs> Which I thought was genius. <laughs> so there's two hashtags, just so you know. <laughs> um, what's next for me? I really have no idea. I mean, obviously, promoting the book um, and I hope you know that we're able to start a movement uh, to bring people from all walks of life together um, and also talking about you know, like I said difficult conversations but to be honest with you I'm just open with whatever the future holds you know fingers crossed it's good <laughs> yeah.